Um, so welcome everyone. Um, just a quick run through of the um, code of conduct. Uh, welcome to the uh, OLS 8 week 12 session. This is the Open Science Gardens um, session number three. Um, just a brief reminder of the code of conduct and community participation guidelines. I'll share these in the chat. Um, these meetings follow those um, uh, that written guidelines and you should uh, have the contact details of people to um, report to if you witness any um, unacceptable behaviour or have any other concerns um, in the shared notes document as well. Um, a reminder that this call is being recorded and transcribed. Um, so as Yo said, please turn off your video if you prefer to be off video. Um, you can also follow the transcription by following the link on the top of the Zoom screen. They're being provided by Otter AI. Um, and there should be a, a button at the top that says otter.ai. Click here to open the live transcript. Oh, and Malvika has helpfully um, put it in the chat. It's very good. Um, Finally, uh, hopefully folks are uh, familiar with this now, but um, for breakout rooms, we will have speaking and writing breakout rooms, um, and you should indicate your preference for either of them by editing your name on Zoom to add a W for written reflection-based exercises or S for spoken discussion breakout rooms. Um, and this just helps us to assign breakout rooms with format of your choice. So if you're in a, a speaking mood or a writing mood, you can choose based on what you prefer. Um, but please do pick one, um, even if you don't mind which one. Um, so now I'm delighted to be handing over to uh, Malvika and Lena Carvascalia. Sorry, Lena, that, that might not be the right pronunciation of your name, um, uh, to introduce us to the Open Science Gardens. Thank you, Ariel. I think Ariel just demonstrated why we need that app of name. Uh, all right, so this is week 12, and uh, right before we hit recording, we're we were saying that at this point of cohort, you all have become very familiar with what we're doing, and, uh, particularly for this cohort. Bernice has put together an introduction for each cohort call what, to, to show you where we are at, what you would be learning today. So you, we are currently in the Open Science Garden Part 3. We're calling it garden because of all the different things and care that we provide within the garden, but we get to pick and choose what we do at a given point. So in the part three, um, this comes from our UNESCO framework. We are looking at different aspects of open science. We have looked at open access before. This particular one focuses on open source software, hardware, and infrastructure. We would have three speakers uh, who are already on the call who would be talking about these topics uh, separately. And you would also have a chance to discuss uh, and reflect on these in a breakout session. So uh, we have a sponsor for this call. We don't have sponsor for all the call, but uh, very kindly, uh, VU Amsterdam, specifically Lena Kavroskaya's team has uh, offered funding for two of these calls and I'll hand it over to her to introduce what her work is and how they're connected with Open Seeds. To you, Thank Lena. you so much. Thanks. So I, my name is Lena Karwowska. I work at the FIU Amsterdam uh, as community manager for Open Science. And uh, um, our Open Science program, which you see on the, yeah, the, 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 the website of which you can see on the slide, wanted to support courageous individuals at the um, at the few who want to make their work more open so we were very lucky that uh, open seeds agreed to partner with us so we could uh, offer uh, grants uh, small grants to projects who participated in this uh, OLS cohort there are eight few projects who are participating we're, uh, we're super happy about them and yeah and this is a great way to support each other i think and to reach out into each other's networks so yeah uh, <laughs> as a part of this uh, cooperation we also support two of the calls and uh, i hope you enjoy this one 
Thank you so much, Lena. One thing that I really enjoyed in one of the previous calls that uh, Lena's team had sponsored where you mentioned that Lena was our participant from very first cohort. And uh, over the last cohort, uh, she has become our mentor and expert and have now become partner and collaborator through organization really exemplifies how our participants within open life science or OLS now, I keep calling it by the previous name have been championing open science in their organization in their own country. So it's really inspiring to have Lena sitting next to us and uh, introducing this call. So with that, I am very happy to hand over to my co-facilitator. I'm gonna <laughs> scroll down. Ariel, back to you actually, to introduce our first speaker. Oh, I think you're muted, Ariel. I am muted. You would have thought after four years of this, I would be familiar with this. No. Um, delighted to introduce you to Hannah. Um, they will be talking to us today about open source software. Um, I'm afraid I don't have your slides in front of me, Hannah, but please, over to you. Yeah, um, hold on. Let me, yes, I'll share my screen and I can share the slides um, afterwards. So one second. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about reproducibility and sustainability in open source software. Well, Hannah, we can see your presenter view. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let me try again. Mm. Oh, an error occurred. Okay, that's fine. I'll present without. Um, so, uh. Yeah, hi everyone. I'll be talking about reproducibility and sustainability in open source. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my full name is Hannah Ferluchkai. My pronouns are she, they. I'm currently a PhD student at the School of Information at UT Austin, advised by Dr. James Howison. My research interests revolve around open source software um, and the communities that support open source software, diversity, equity, and inclusion in those communities, and the role of identity in open source um, careers and work-life balance. Um, and so while I don't uh, study open science specifically, there's a lot of overlap between open source and open science. So open source is the movement to make uh, software open for anyone to view, use, and contribute to. I put a little asterisk there because there are, of course, some exceptions. Um, and Anna, I'm uh, sorry, I'm just going to jump in here because unfortunately we're still stuck on your, um, oh, no. slide. let me, I will stop your participants sharing. And then if you try and refresh, yes. hopefully that'll take care of whatever gremlin was in the system. Yes. Yeah. Um, so sorry to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's not an online call if we don't have at least one inappropriate mute and one weird shared, shared slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let's try again. So if I'm on presenter view, are you seeing presenter view or? We are seeing presenter view with your, your notes. So I think it's oh. the opposite one. I oh, know. What about there, there we go we can see that now yes okay awesome. great 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 um okay so i'll skip the introduction just did that um right lots of alignment between the missions of open source software and open science um and a lot of values that are aligned between them so transparency in both cases um open source values transparency in code production and open science values transparency in research they both encourage collaboration between you know developers and open source um, and contributors and different forms of contributions and open science encourages collaboration between um, academics researchers and industry professionals knowledge production obviously usually in the form of technical contributions for open source but not exclusively. Um, open science is more geared towards novel and significant scientific uh, research contributions, quality of contributions for both of them, and reliability. So we want secure and trustworthy code, just as we want rigorous and valid uh, research. 
And um, in my view, in terms of my research, I see open scientific software as one part of open source software. And so while they're not the same, there are a lot of there are a lot of lessons that we can take from open source software that are applicable to open science. Um, so open source software is a tool that is used by open science to help disseminate that knowledge back into society. So open source makes scientific software accessible and available for people to contribute to and use, provided that um, the software is being maintained and is being updated with a strong community behind it. Um, researchers can then leverage this software in this in their work. Um, they publish their results, share their data and software, and may even contribute back to open source. And in that case, they're usually referred to as research software engineers. And so these two aspects work together to provide a broader impact on society, which um, bolsters the impact of so software and scientific research, supports reproducibility and reuse uh, of this research and collaboration across open source development, and benefits the dissemination of science and technologies across society. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to using open scientific software. Um, so a lot of data sets are already pulled and filtered. Um, that allows for replication studies uh, on the same data sets as well, and methods may be reused. Um, it allows for researchers to connect with other researchers who are closely aligned um, in research topics. And again, it's free for people to view and use. Again, there are some accessibility requirements and there is a high barrier to learning, but um, yeah, it is free, which is nice. Um, there are benefits to contributing back as well. Um, so giving back to the open source community, all of this runs on um, just the shared ethos of peer production and working together in open source. And 96% um, of code bases use open source software. So it's incredibly important to society and it's good to contribute back. Um, also working on a shared um, software project can help you deepen involvement with other researchers and academics. Um, it can increase the visibility of your research and your work if that's something you desire. And um, Linus's law as well, which is um, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So when you have enough people working on software, which is um, made easier through open source, all bugs are sort of um, easy to figure out and find with enough people on it. Um, yeah, and some tips for reproducibility. Um, spend time on high quality replication packages if you can. Um, organize your own replication package. So that means documentation, um, making things clear for how people can use your packages, create an update documentation of your package and code, and provide accessible, legible, uh, clean code. Um, and so connected to um, reproducibility is sustainability of scientific software, which is critical to its success and longevity. Um, and in this case, a sort of less recognized or underappreciated factor in the sustainability and success of scientific software is the community around it. Um, yeah, maintaining these packages would not be possible without developers um, maintaining and developing them. And uh, you need people to use these packages as well. And so community is incredibly Important. And so a lot of questions arise around the community to help you understand the software and uh, the motivations behind it. So first, who are the shareholders? Who are the um, developers? Who are the users of the project? What are their backgrounds? Um, what is influencing the direction of the project? What are people's motivations? What are their unique um, constraints and goals? Um, what enables developers to maintain the software? So um, in the case of scientific software, a lot of it is funded by funding agencies such as governments and foundations. So what is the funding plan look like and what is the plan to sustain the project after the funding has run out? And how does this enable um, contributors of the project to keep contributing? Um, how is the community structured? How, are the, how do they organize themselves, their decision making? Um, how do they manage tasks across the project? 
And what do valued contributions and an involvement trajectory look like in the community? Um, a healthy community is vital to a project's success. Um, one indicator of that is bus factor, which is a little bit morbid, but it's a um, metric used in open source software communities uh, to understand basically how many people in your project need to be hit by a bus before you are unable to make progress on the project anymore. And so the higher that number is, the better for your project. Um, there And yeah, there are many benefits to having a large community around a software project. So more time, energy, and resources available with more people means more perspectives, which can influence the design and creation of the software. Um, Linus's law again, with more people, you have um, more people able to contribute to finding bugs, which impacts the security and trust of the software. And so since community is so important, how do we foster community growth and health? Um, and so that's a longer discussion, but some things for uh, some recommendations for open source projects, which are also things to look out for as an open source contributor is whether the organizational structure is transparent and clear. Um, what is the contribution process? How can you help as a contributor? How can you get started? Um, what is a progression through the project look like? And this arises from um, a essay called The Tyranny of Structurallessness, which sort of critiques some feminist movements who prided themselves on being unstructured, but there's always structure. And by making it implicit uh, and opaque, you're actually providing a barrier for people who are new to these structures or people who are neurodivergent. So yeah, making sure those structures are clear. Um, we want to support diverse perspectives and involvement. Not only is it the right thing to do, but this promotes creativity, productivity, and innovation in these projects. And um, focusing on making the community or joining a community that feels like an inclusive space. So, um, you know, there's, again, a whole other discussion on this, but some ways are to invite people to contribute and mentor newcomers and help them figure out the contribution process and how to be more involved in providing allyship. Um, open communication, so transparency across all platforms, so anyone contributing to the project can sort of be kept up to date. Um, inclusive language and signals, um, centering and protecting underrepresented voices. What I mean by that is there's a growing discourse in open source on not only the inclusion of codes of conduct, but also the enforcement of them. And a certain amount of accountability is required for these documents to be um, actually protect people. And so that's something to look out for. Are people actually following through on code of conduct infringements? And finally, recognizing invisible forms of work, um, documentation, organizing community events. These are all critical to community health. And this type of work is usually not as valued as technical contributions, but they're still incredibly integral to developing the community. And also this work tends to be taken up by underrepresented contrib contributors. And so that's something to keep an eye out for as well. And yeah, that's it for me. Thanks everyone. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Hannah. Very much appreciate that. And thank you to folks who have been sharing in the notes as well. Um, we do have some questions uh, in the uh, shared notes document. Um, the first one up was a question around whether um, the, use, the use of the term open source software or free and open source software. Um, Yo had some distinctions between free and open source software that uh, were in the chat that then um, got transposed over. I um, had a, a question about how to balance sort of the importance of maintaining packages of open source software with sort of the overarching thriving incentives that are present across academia towards novelty. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a few other. Um, gotcha. Okay. Well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's, I, I've got a question in there. Um, I, I don't see any other questions in there. Or... Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, 
I can uh, thank you, Yo, for uh, talking about the distinction between uh, OSS and FOSS and FLOSS. That's another one too. Um, so how to balance maintenance of packages with the driving incentives presented across a lot of academia towards novelty. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is sort of coming from my experience this past summer working with the ECP Exascale Computing Project, but um, a lot of people were talking about how that funding schedule was a lot longer than usual funding schedule. So it was five to six years, I believe, which is longer than usual. And so that helped people sort of feel more relaxed, not relaxed, but they felt, you know, less stressed about, um, you know, where's the money going to go as they had more time and they didn't really have to uh, as frequently provide these reports on progress and they could sort of focus on the work a little bit better. And so by having these longer funding schedules and these generous funding schedules, that can help promote um, people collaborating collaborating with one another, developing more trust amongst multiple people because you're working together for longer. And that sort of all contributes to, um, you know, better research, better community, and not, in a way, novelty. I can't really speak to, like, how do we make research more novel? But I think, you know, just involving more people and more perspectives is always helpful there. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Any other questions or anything in the chat? I'm not seeing any more. Put the hands up. Um, Derek does have a question. Oh, maybe more of a comment on invisible work. The invisible forms of work is really important to keeping the whole thing together. Is this a bit like duct tape? Um, yeah, absolutely. Everyone's... Nodding along. Yeah, um, just there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. That's not just, you know, what you see on GitHub. That's not just technical contributions that um, is critical to maintaining the health of a community. So one, responding to user requests, that's, you know, something that people have to do and it is a form of labor and it's not the most flashy or attractive one, but connecting with your community and helping to build the software towards the directions that your users are going to align with. Um, and organizing events for the community to create shared um, knowledge, shared learning, shared values, um, documentation to encourage people to come in. And, you know, with people coming in, you're sort of reducing the risk of that bus factor and helping them. Uh, and yeah, through that documentation, through mentorship, you're um, encouraging a longer tenure of contributors in open source, which again, contributes to a stronger project health. Great. Thanks very much, Hannah. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over to Irene uh, to take us through the next section. Yes, thank you. So our next speaker is Tania Hernandez, and she will talk about open infrastructures. Um, I will let Tania introduce herself. Tania, are you ready? Yes, so let me start sharing my screen. Uh, thank you. So, good. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you so much for uh, OLS leadership, for hosting this space and for the invitation to speak uh, today. Um, yeah, this is Tania Hernandez. I'm a research data analyst at Invest in Open Infrastructure. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Invest in Open Infrastructure, uh, we call them uh, we call it IOI. So we are a nonprofit initiative dedicated uh, to improving funding and resourcing for open community-owned technologies and systems, supporting research and scholarship. And at IOI, I conduct uh, research on organizations that provide open infrastructure services with an emphasis on governance and sustainability elements. Prior joining IOI, I, I, I was a researcher. I'm still a, I'm a researcher, but um, most of my focus was on studying the behavior of uh, nonprofits in the US. 
So my background is in organizational behavior and nonprofit management and leadership. And in today's presentation, I will present some ideas that have been useful for my daily practice to understand and study open science infrastructures. And you will see a lot of similarities uh, with uh, Hannah's presentation that I probably frame it a little bit different, but that, uh, that I'm happy to see that uh, some of the ideas are really aligned and you will see just in a moment. So uh, let me start with a working definition and some examples. So I'm proposing to define open science infrastructures as systems and tools that rely on both physical and digital infrastructure intended to provide open services for the scientific community. And by open services, I mean uh, no cost or sometimes low cost services that are easily accessible to users. Now uh, we have, and you will see in today's uh, presentations, Hannah uh, just talk about uh, open software, but we have a diverse spectrum of open science infrastructure, uh, each fulfilling the needs of the scientific community. We have, for instance, open access journals and preprint repositories that allow the scholarly community to access to specialized knowledge. Uh, I can put an example, La Referencia, for instance, is a Latin American network of open access repositories. Uh, talking about preprints, Archive in the, is a US-based initiative that hosts uh, scientific preprints. So researchers don't need to wait until a paper is published to have access to that knowledge. Now on open software, you just hear Hannah, uh, but uh, there are also multiple providers of open software. An example, typical example is R, an open software, free software, um, so, sorry, that is an open source free software environment. Another is Jupyter, a free software with open standards and web services for interactive computing across all programming languages. And I can go on and on with examples. Uh, for instance, there are uh, open cloud services that help researchers uh, run analysis directly on the cloud and a growing number of open data repositories that allow researchers to deposit data online for public access. And you can name any other examples here. I'm just uh, trying to make sense and to um, show with these examples the diverse spectrum and that uh, each of these are fulfilling specific needs of the scientific community. Let me uh, stop with the examples and propose uh, three major components that may help us to understand or even design open science infrastructures. I know that uh, some of you are working on the designing or refining on open science infrastructures. So I hope the outline of these three major components uh, is helpful for you. Um, so first we have, of course, uh, the infrastructure component. And let me emphasize with the duality of the physical and digital infrastructure. And I know that later today we will have also a presentation on hardware. But uh, my point here is that as many of you are aware, even though we are living in a digitalized world, the reality is that digital services still rely on physical servers, computer equipment, and reliable internet connection. Uh, my point here, and because I know some of you, again, are in the process of creating and refining open infrastructure, is that an optimal design of any form of open science infrastructure should consider both the physical infrastructure needed to run the physical components optimally. And I'm saying this aloud because uh, I am familiar with uh, projects that are designed in, you know, like uh, in some contexts that probably do not apply well in a different context because uh, they do not take into consideration this 
almost basic elements uh, on the uh, hardware or the physical infrastructure needed. Uh, the second component is the open science infrastructure, uh, is that the open science infrastructure have a social component. And Hannah mentioned this uh, really well, all the invisible work that is out there uh, behind uh, these many uh, open science infrastructure. Um, they, they not only provide a space for collaboration among research communities, but many of these infrastructures are volunteer driven efforts, which means that uh, they rely on free labor of participants of research communities, right? That can include professors, students, technicians, among others, right? Like the professionals that are not necessarily in the academic circles, um, the, myself, uh, I'm an example of that. I mean, the nonprofit world, right? That sometimes is really hard for other people that are not part of the academic circles to be part of the scientific knowledge. In any case, my point here is that visibilizing volunteer work, and I'm echoing Hannah totally uh, on this, is important so that people uh, who cannot volunteer can still have access to the services. Sometimes we see these services as, you know, like as an interchange, right? Like, so there are developers that provide free labor in open software, right? Like, well, there are so many people and communities that they, they cannot volunteer because they have time constraints, right? Like they need to work, like to pay the bills. So we need like a proper design of the uh, open science infrastructure required uh, some, um, some uh, deep thinking about the requirements that we uh, that they are asking uh, for the users or for the contributors. Uh, the third component, and to my to my eyes, is probably the most important part of the open science infrastructure. Is that uh, these these tools and systems are usually a space for people to test and prototype solutions for the research community. So um, we have seen uh, an open AI will be a good example, right? Like some of these infrastructures even become a commercial entities, right? Like, and this, this open, open science infrastructure can have uh, various goals, but many of them remain as nonprofit initiatives. And what is the value of these nonprofit initiatives? That they provide free or local services to researchers and the scholarly communities. And um, here I want to emphasize uh, the non-for-profit uh, goals. So that doesn't mean that they still need revenue, right? Like, uh, you know, like uh, these open science infrastructure sometimes relied on funding from foundations, from government grants and you can name all the different sources. Uh, that's the revenue they are having, right? Like the revenue is coming not from the users sometimes, uh, but from foundations that support this kind of, 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 of services. And we have other cases, right? Like they, they, it, the accessibility is based on the low cost of the services um, comparing to uh, commercial counterparts that they probably uh, charge more. Um, lastly, I have a put, I have, uh, I'm proposing here a list of elements that I, that I consider are important in designing uh, open science infrastructures. I already talked about uh, many of these points, uh, except probably the governance component, that is the third box. So um, the thing that I would like to propose is that open science infrastructure to truly serve the needs of the research communities they are intended to provide the services. The ideal is that they should include representatives of the communities and they, they serve in the, in the decision-making processes. And I believe that that is critical and, and super important uh, because it's the only way that uh, this open infrastructure uh, will stay true somehow to the need that the research communities have identified. 
sometimes as um, you know these services become complex and so the 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 leadership goes like far out far out far from the needs of the research communities so a proper design again um it's uh, or an ideal design uh, allows should allow a space for the representatives of the communities to continue um, to continue uh, the involvement in the decision making processes. And here I am speaking really generally about decision making processes. But this operationalized, you can see this is um, as you know, like that members of the communities are part of uh, the board of directors of these uh, services that have have a voice in the decision making uh, processes they can serve as advisory boards um, and you can name any other like inclusion of these voices in decision making processes um, i believe that i have already described the other elements in the checklist so uh, the last idea that i have for you and for the ones especially that are designing open science infrastructure services, is that I also encourage you to consult uh, the principles of a scholarly infrastructure, uh, refer as POSI, and the forest framework. Um, you will have there more ideas and even detailed guidelines for designing open science infrastructure um, as organizations and the specific details for the services. Um, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm here to start the, um, and, to, and to see any questions that you will have. And again, thank you so much for OLS leadership for hosting this space. Thank you, Tanya. We do have a couple of questions in the notepad. Um, and the first is, um, when open infrastructure is placed in the cloud, it means that local capacity is not developed. Um, and so the, the benefits of localization might be lost. Um, could you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you uh, for the one that put that example because that's precisely my point. So um, yeah, uh, Still, still the cloud uh, services need the internet connection. And I can speak uh, specifically about uh, some parts of Africa that is still like the concrete example that I can give you. Uh, we, 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 we have noticed uh, a case of a researcher wanted to use cloud services. And this person is based in Africa. So he relies on uh, their own cell phone internet connection to have access to the cloud services. So, you know, like we can see like, well, is the cloud infrastructure is there, but it's still the basic elements that we need to run the cloud infrastructure are, are not fulfilling in that specific example that I can give you, right? Like uh, the internet connection is, uh, is still needed. And there are other complexities, right? Like uh, still you have, and I'm not the technical expert here, but to run cloud services, still you need some like some capacity in your computer. So if your computer is not uh, up to the standards for using the cloud services, you also have that access is limited there. And uh, I know that many of these open infrastructures um, uh, work in so many assumptions, such as the internet, such as the equipment. Um, and that's a reality, right? Like, uh, and, and they work well in some context. My, my point here is that if you are really hoping to have that these open infrastructures are more accessible to, you know, like different contexts, and outside uh, the global north. So you, there is the need to consider those physical elements uh, um, for a proper design. Thank you. And we have two other questions that are related to the innovation component that you mentioned. Um, and the question is, do you know of good examples of important innovations in research or science 
uh, taking off from free infrastructures provided by non for profits organizations? Um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, uh, we have really good examples. Uh, I, uh, I would restrict myself from pointing out those because, you know, like um, in investing in open infrastructure, uh, we are working on, on that. So I will be happy to share those resources afterwards. But um, the, to try to answer, this is a really uh, good question, but to try to answer this, yes, um, the emphasis uh, and some of the work at IOI has been around identifying those services that are free, that provide um, no cost or low cost alternatives to commercial uh, counterparts. So I will, I will share those links afterwards. And do you have um, a general idea of um, who is driving that innovation component? Um, so are they universities, is it the government? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question as well. Most of my experience uh, has been uh, like th those good examples are usually uh, driven or initiated by researchers in academic institutions uh, that uh, probably start as university, you know, like initiative or program and that later become independent organizations. So that's kind of the, the usual path that I'm seeing. Others directly start as a nonprofit and even become a commercial, right? Like uh, a commercial entity. That's kind of the, the second most common um, uh, way on how, how these are initiated and how they progress. Thank you again, Tanya. Um, I see that there, there are some discussions happening in, in the chat, uh, but we are short in time, so we are going to stop uh, this now. Um, and please, everyone, give a round of applause for Tanya and for her presentation. And next, we have a breakout discussion um, as an exercise to reflect on all of these topics about open science. So um, I will introduce this activity and Malvika will be creating the breakout rooms. So if you haven't um, chosen whether you, you want to participate in a greeting room or in a spoken room, please add an S or a W in front of your name. And speakers, if you also want to join one group, please also change your name. So in this breakout room, um, we want you to reflect on whether you practice or advocate for open source software, open infrastructure, or open practices in general. And if you do, please be a little bit more specific and tell us how you do that. Um, and the last point, um, what is the difference to you between practicing open science and advocating for open science? Um, I think those are three questions that are very interesting and at this stage of the program, hopefully you have already um, have more experience and more knowledge to um, connect these questions to your own projects and to your own experiences. So Malvika, do we have the rooms ready? Yes. Um, so I'm going to open drum. Just wanted to check if Ariel and Irina, you would like to go to a room if I can assign you. I haven't assigned you into any room. So we'll just send you both to each room. I can join the spoken room. Thank you. All right, there you all go. So I think we are all back from the breakout rooms. Hopefully you had a great discussion. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Ariel, who will introduce our next and last speaker. Yes, hello everyone. Delighted to introduce our final speaker, Pierre Padilla. Uh, 
I believe they're on the call. Yeah, over to you. Hi, thank, thanks for the invitation. Thank you for having me. So let me share my screen. Um, okay. Please, could you confirm if you can see my, my screen? We can see the um, sort of the working view of the PowerPoint. It's not in present view or presentation view yet. Now we can. Yep. No. You're all set. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm Pierre Padilla Guamantinco. I'm a graduate researcher uh, at the Institute for Biological and Medical uh, Engineering. And I also associate researcher of the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Alexander von Humboldt. So these institutions are located in Chile and Peru, uh, respectively. So today I will talk briefly about open science hardware. And I hope this talk motivates you to join our community as end users or even better as a hardware developers. So in my case, uh, my first contact with open hardware communities uh, was in 2014. Uh, my, my journey started learning how to build 3D printers and how these uh, digital manufacturing technologies uh, could be applied to develop custom and low cost biomedical devices. So since then, I've participated in different uh, projects sorry, and different projects uh, and initiative uh, and communities in general where the open science hardware was, was the core. My last uh, experience this year uh, were being a member of the GOSH Community Council um, and help with the governance of the global open science hardware community. And as a technology fellow of the Latin American Hub for uh, Bioimaging uh, through open hardware, uh, I've been uh, developing uh, open source bio instrument and teaching a researcher how to build their, their own equipment. So uh, before defining what is open science hardware and giving you some, some example, uh, we need first some context. Um, for doing research, uh, we require appropriate tools in order to answer uh, our scientific questions. In life science, for example, uh, we usually find this instrument that you can see uh, on the left, right? And what they have in common is that they are uh, black boxes. So the issue here is that um, on one hand, uh, we are told that we must trust uh, the data generated by these uh, black boxes that were designed by different manufacturers. And in the other hand, they don't always meet um, our needs. So they are usually expensive, they have limited uh, functionalities, or they are designed for a specific settings, as some of you mentioned of, of the comment in, uh, today in, the, in this session. So I'm from Peru, um, a country in the Western South America, and its unique geography it has allowed it to, to host uh, one of the greatest biodiversity. But the same geography makes research uh, a challenging task. Why? Well, in our case, uh, we usually import uh, equipment that was designed in the global north and that was designed to the global north market. So you can imagine uh, how uh, uh, and how difficult could be uh, also implement this kind of uh, instrument for doing research. And this concept shouldn't be a surprise, right? In, in academia, we usually learn um, the red path that you can see in this, in this picture. So to develop technology, which perpetuates uh, what I mentioned before. So in response to these issues that I, that I mentioned, open science hardware emerged as a potential solution to to democratize uh, technology, access to technology. So um, we'll find different definitions of open science hardware, okay? Um, I like these two definitions, one uh, by the Open Source Hardware Association, which uh, mentioned that 
an open source hardware is hardware whose uh, design is made uh, publicly available. So anyone can study, uh, modify, distribute, make, and, and sell the design or the hardware based on that design. And in the case of open science hardware, actually are those hardware that are used for scientific uh, investigation. And, and this is the definition that, that we use um, as uh, the, the, the global community. So how is the development cycle of uh, open science hardware? Um, actually it's similar to other technologies. So you start this cycle identifying a problem or a need, and then you create prototype as potential solution. So the end of the cycle is a product in our case, a scientific instrument. But what makes open science hardware special? So, well, the result, as you can see uh, on the right, are not only the product. You can also access to the bill of material, the assembly instructions, the source file. So then this information and this kind of resources allow you to, as I mentioned, to study, to use, to modify, to, to make them or even sell it if you want. So this instrument perform as well as proprietary technologies while offering increased uh, customizability and also significantly lower cost. This is another picture that mentioned why it's so relevant to have this uh, kind of uh, feature. So, how this in this picture and on the left you can see how is a traditional hardware and how is the, the, the open science hardware. So the, the difference between them. So the adoption doesn't finish only using the, the hardware. So having this kind of resources allows you also to, to become a maintainer of this technology and eventually and also a developer. So having all these uh, access to, to this kind of, of resources uh, allows to prevent uh, technological uh, obsolescence and also foster uh, innovation. So in, on the right, we can see some of the benefits that you will get as user and also the, the scientific community, uh, how you can contribute to uh, developing open source hardware. Okay. so. Um, I would like to share a, briefly about this a, example. So here, one of, have one of the most known a, projects in the in the global community. A, the name is the project is a Open Flexure Project, and in this case, well, the the challenge was how we can design and fabricate something like in a microscope that, despite its evolution they keep like similar or more or less the, the same mechanical and optical uh, functionalities. So a group of scientists in the University of Bath, they started developing this flexible mechanism using 3D printing, as, as you can see. So they started with a focusing assembly system, the C axis, and then they start developing uh, all these different version, uh, as you can see on the picture. So. Now they have the version seven of this instrument that is a, a lab grade, a motorized microscope. And having these uh, features has allowed other researchers to modify the instrument and add other features, as you can see here in, in some use cases, uh, in this case in lab science. Due to the low cost, because this uh, microscope uh, costs less than $300 uh, has allowed the, this uh, a wide adoption. So according to some numbers from the forum, uh, this microscope uh, has been reproduced in more than 40 countries uh, since uh, 2016. And um, this is an example what we did in Chile uh, where I am uh, now. Um, I, I was able to build four microscopes in one week and then use them uh, for a teaching course with undergrad students. So we took some sample from a pond in the university and then they were able to, to see through the, the microscope. No? And then you can see a, a mosaic made by one uh, group 
uh, they took several pictures and create this uh, big picture of the, the whole uh, the slides. Well, finally, um, if you want to start uh, this journey of open science hardware, now you will find um, different resources, online training programs, repositories, specific scientific journals, and also if you want to document and share your projects, then you have a, a diverse of tools. Uh, last but not least important, uh, I want to invite you to, to join to the gathering for open science hardware, that this the name also stands for the global open science hardware community. Um, these are some of the accomplishments that we are proud. Um, we hope to eventually host uh, our next uh, gathering. So you don't need to, to have a, a technical background to join to, to the community and also to, to join to the, to, the, to the gatherings. And well, this is the reference uh, from this talk. So you have the access uh, to this presentation. I, I shared the link on the Etherpad. And thank you. I, I want to thank you all the agencies and institutions that allowed me to, to keep working on this uh, topic that I, I am passionate about. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, uh, we've got a bit of time, I think, very quickly for questions. Uh, there is one um, from Derek online 234 which says open science hardware is a black box. I suspect that the reason why the black box remains opaque is because budget is spent on marketing and not documentation. There is an incentive to keep the box opaque because it keeps you in a job. Is this fair or too broad? Um, so that's Derek's question. Um, I can't see any other questions in the chat at the moment, but do feel free to add yours if you have any. Can I rephrase that question to you here? Because Please, I don't yeah. know if I agree. <laughs> Do you agree uh, with the comment that the funding is required for marketing and not enough funding is going in the documentation and also the incentives specifically? So if I understood well, uh, do you mean the, the purpose of the funding in general to, to support projects and how this is orientated. Maybe, maybe Derek, you can correct me, but maybe my rephrasing was to specifically understand where do you think the funding currently is going within open hardware movement, if at all? Well, in in our case, um, as part of the community, I, I, I helped to, to create a, our, our design a collaborative development program and in this case, uh, our funder, which uh, was uh, the Sloan Foundation, they allow us to actually to, to invest um, some money uh, for funding uh, open science uh, hardware in general. So this this kind of budget uh, allow the the participants of, of the program to to spend some money uh, in, in one category. They could uh, buy uh, any component and any hardware that they need are tools or, or electronic components to, 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 to develop their, their prototypes. And the other category, uh, this one allowed uh, to hire uh, experts uh, for uh, go to mass production, right? Because uh, when you have a prototype, you still need to, de to develop maybe some boards because they, they, they are not robust for, for an end user, for example. So then they, they have someone that is expert designing uh, these printed circuit boards, and then they can help to, to have the next version that could be more or less like an end product. I don't know if it's more or less, <laughs> um, it's related to what uh, was this, this question, but, or Derek, maybe you, you, you can ask again. I, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to work out um, the, the incentives here um, that, 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 I, that I, I see around kind of um, 
getting op open hardware were out. I mean, I think your project sounds fantastic. And I know a whole lot of, of people who do 3D printing. Um, um, and I'm obviously going to point these things out to them. Um, but but I'm, I'm just imagining your documentation is far more thorough than the kind of marketing around that, just because you're being specific about the, the project itself. And I think that's laudable, but then it's just really hard for other people to be drawn in because they, they don't actually hear about the, 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 the stuff that you've done because you've just documented it. And I'm just wondering if that's a, if, if what I'm describing is a fair assumption or have I got it entirely wrong? Okay. Um, I think that I mean, I, I don't have a, a, maybe an, an, an answer because I, I think a, there are like different experiences in, in terms of, of what, what you mentioned. And I think, a, yeah, it, it will depend. Um, I, okay. I'm, 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 yes, I'm, I'm, I'm talk, I can talk more about uh, my, my context <laughs> here in Chile in South America, um, but this could be different. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know, in, yeah. in, in, in Europe. Or I, I, I'm making too a broader generalization, uh, mm -hmm. and I hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other questions or uh, questions in the chat either. Um, you had a, somebody very helpfully took notes um, as well, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to hand back over to Irina to um closes out i think yes thank you Ariel, and thank you again to all of our speakers in this session um so this is the end of the open garden series um and just uh, a few reminders for our upcoming activities in this week we have an in-depth um, session on documentation and metadata on friday so if you are available for that, please join us. Um, it will be a slightly different format. We will be um, spending more time on the discussion side and we will have a lot, a lot of time for questions um, for our expert. Um, and I think that's everything for today. If you have any feedback for um, this session in particular, please leave it in the pad um, at the end of the pad. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, I think that's that's all. I'm Joe, laughing Malvika, is because I was just going to say it's when you and Malvika does not run the call, call ends five minutes early. <laughs> well done, you all, for sharing perfectly. Thank you so much again, our co facilitator, Ariel and Irene, and the speakers. Thank you so much, Tanya, for sticking around for the whole call and for joining us. Amazing, amazing talks. See you all next time. <laughs>